Our next uh, speakers are from Dumfries and Galloway. Um, Joe Coppola, if I've got that right. Coppola. Coppola, thank you, um, is a health and well-being specialist um, in Dumfries and Galloway. She is uh, working in the Joint Health and Well-Being Unit and has had a long experience of working with uh, uh, children and young people in particular around health improvement. And the uh, second speaker from the same unit is uh, someone I have already got to know, Michelle McCoy, who is a public health consultant. We knew her when she was in East Lothian, uh, well, Lothian, but she helped us set up uh, an early development instrument pilot in P1 students now completing. And uh, so I know her and uh, greatly appreciate the leadership she showed in that role. And uh, the two of them are going to talk to us today about their approach in Dumfries and Galloway. Thank you. Um, uh, thank you for that introduction, John. Um, uh, Joe and I um, have been asked to present on the approach being taken uh, in Dumfries and Galloway to address the health needs of young people. And I hope that what we're going to do is to, to be able to give you at least a flavour of the approach taken and how it fits in with some of the approaches that have already been discussed earlier today. And, and it's about the, our efforts locally to progress an asset-based approach, a holistic approach, um, which, as, as already stated earlier, it, one that recognises that, that health can be affected by the social and economic conditions, the physical environment, and so we need to take account of all of these things, these interlinked factors, and uh, take account of them all to, to improve the situation. And a strength-based approach um, which, just to reiterate what's been said already today, it's, it, it takes a perspective um, not, not from starting from the problem or a deficit, but rather that uh, what's, what's good about a person's life or, or that, that of a community. And finally, um, what, what we want to illustrate is, is um, what we're doing locally to, to take an approach which begins with the individual or community's priority and not that of others. And there has been some discussion about this earlier today, but I think it's important to reiterate that in other words, it's not about what the professionals um, are, are going in to do and tell people what is wrong and what they should be doing, but instead it's about working with communities. We've split the presentation into two, um, and what I'm going to do is to give you a little bit of the context and Joe will give you some of the practical examples. Um, I've put this slide into the presentation because I felt it was a reminder of the fact that being an adolescent is a stage. And I was glad to see that a number of people have made that reference. And we all know where it comes after childhood and before adulthood. I think it's important to remember that it is this stage, and also that it's not a negative stage, as so often can be portrayed, and both Harry and Grant made reference to that in the session this morning. So when addressing the health needs of adolescents and recognizing that it is a stage, it's important to consider what we do before that stage, during that stage, or, and during that stage, because they're all important in terms of health um, improvement and reducing health inequalities. So the context, for those of you who don't know where Dumfries and Galloway is located, it's the southwest corner of Scotland. It has an aging population, but it also has a significant population under the ages of 16 and 29. It's a rural area with small settlements. I'm new to the area, having taken up my post just last September. I have to say I find the region very beautiful. It wasn't somewhere that I knew um, well. Um, probably where I'd most frequently gone to in the area was Dunfries on the way back to, to um, Belfast. But it's an area where there's a lot of farming and tourism, and there's a tradition of mining. Almost 
Almost 50% of the population is classified as rural, and nearly 22% of that is, is classified as being remote rural. And by that we mean rural as being settlements, <coughs> living in settlements of less than 3,000 people, and remote rural are those same settlements of less than 3,000 people, <coughs> but that they're more than 30 minutes from the population from a population of more than 10,000. And all of that is important when we're looking at our services. There's been much reference to, to the, import, the, the, the importance um, of, of poverty on health. When, when, when looking at the Scottish Index of, of Multiple Deprivation, there's 9.6% of the population in, of Dumfries and Galloway are living in areas classified as, as the 20% most deprived in Scotland. And that's not large by comparison to, to other places, but they, they are in small communities spread across the region. And the two largest communities are Dumfries and Stranraer, but they're 75 miles apart. So to summarise the facts, we've got a total population of just over 148,000, which is small. 47% are living in rural areas, and, and, and many of those are, are pretty inaccessible. But what's also, it's important not to just think about the 20% most deprived, because in, in, the, in Dumfries and Galloway, 78, nearly 79%, um, of those that are income deprived live outside those 20% most deprived areas. And that last point is really important because of that impact of poverty on health. So what are the challenges? This slide, you, you'll see that it, it summarizes some of the challenges that we have in terms of adolescent health and well-being in our local area. And they're no different to any of the other areas. But it's also, I think, important to note that whilst each of these facts is a standalone piece of data, they're also interrelated in terms of adolescent health. And that's important to the way that we undertake to address health improvement and well-being in the population group. So I'm reiterating a lot of what has already been said. So what are we doing to address that locally? Dumfries and Galloway has for a long time been committed to a holistic life course approach to health improvement and the reduction of health inequalities. There's, there's also been a recognition that this needed to be progressed in partnership. And that led to the establishment of the Joint Health and Wellbeing Unit um, that Joe and I are both part of. And that was just established in the summer of last year. The unit, which is still to be formally branded, um, brought together strategic strategic leads from both public health um, in the NHS and the local authority and is accountable to both agencies. I suppose we could refer to it as being part of the system that, that Harry referred to earlier. But what it meant was that we were able to bring together resources. Pool, resources were pooled um, from, from both, um, both authorities uh, to address what we know is a highly complex matter and be, because there is no magic solution. Within the unit, there are two teams um, and both have been established around the life course approach. And Joe and I work with the, as part of the, the children and young people's team. There are an, a large number of, of disparate actions that inevitably have been prioritized for the work of, of the team. But what they are all linked by is one overarching theme, and that is to encourage and enable people to take control over their lives. And that means beginning as far back as the antenatal period and even before that. So our programme of ref work reflects this, and we work with individuals and partners across the sectors to progress actions. We're beginning with the antenatal um, period, but we're also beginning, but progressing a big program to support parenting. And we're, we're seeking to 
uh, strengthen the universal service, and I'm going to avoid using targeting, as others have already done, but it is about t tailoring, tailoring support um, to, to best meet need. We know that early child development is key, and, and how a child develops in the first five years in, of life can impact uh, can have an impact for life. So when we think about addressing the, the health needs of adolescents, we need to think about the early years as well. And both Grant and Harry um, this morning noted the, the early impacts that, that early years and family can have on, on all of us. And this is how we're approaching the work in Dumfries and Galloway. Being a parent is probably the most important job of all, and it's one that we get the least preparation for. If we are to improve the health and well-being of our adolescent population, we also need to improve the health and well-being of our children and their families, alongside addressing the risk-taking behaviours in the adolescent stage. So Dumfries and Galloway is making a significant investment in, in this. Summarising just some of the underpinning themes, and I've made reference to these already, but before I finish, just to reiterate, all of our work is aiming to improve the health and well-being across the whole population, and I have got targeted in there, but um, it's about tailor tailoring, tackling health inequalities, taking a person-centred <coughs> approach, starting with their strengths and not their deficits. Core to this work is the WHO definition, which has been around for a very long time, but it does highlight the in inextricable links between social and economic conditions, the physical environment, individual lifestyles and health. The holistic approach, which we've already referred to. So what we're doing is working with and for communities. I'm not saying that, that we've got it right and everything is sorted out in Dumfries and Galloway, but we are trying. So what Joe is now going to do is to illustrate with some examples this life course approach which we are taking forward. Thank you. Okay. In the course of delivering um, the Child Healthy Weight Interventions target in Dumfries and Galloway, um, because a target it is, um, Graeme mentioned it earlier on, and, and he'll testify to that. We have been through a significant learning process that's led us to start looking at this um, with a more generic approach. Now, for anyone who's not familiar with the target, and those of us who've been involved in it for the last few years will find it very hard to believe that anyone doesn't know the, every detail of this target. All boards are required to deliver interventions to a target number of children between the ages of 2 and 15 who are above the 91st centile. In Dumfries and Galloway, we delivered 253 targets um, between 2008 and 11, and between 2011 and 14, we're required to deliver a further 413. Um, while we were um, required to develop our own approach to this, that, that, it, we were given a, a framework of guidance to work from. And the elements that were essential to whatever programmes we develop were dietary modification, increased physical activity, and to decrease um, inactivity among young people, but also that programmes would be family-centred, would motivate and support children and, young fa children and families, and to bring about behaviour change. Now, while we were very clear that we had a target to deliver, we were also very clear from the outset that we wanted our work to be very focused on the individual needs of children and their families, and that we would start from where they were. And what we found is, in the course of this work, is that for every child and their family, healthy weight is very rarely a single issue. The experience of all, where all of us working to deliver these inter interventions is that the living situation, the living reality for most children and their families is that it's a very, it's a, their living reality is very complex and healthy weight just sits amongst all of that. My slide shows a number of the issues that have come up um, as our staff have been in, and worked with families, but I'll just focus on a few. 
For example, one member of staff, and it's in an area where most of our interventions take place, he says that every single child or young person that he's worked with has experienced bullying. The bullying generates isolation, not engaging in school, which in turn gener very often generates bad behaviour and can lead to exclusions from school. And that, that leads to a whole lot of um, isolation from, from experiences, and particularly experiences to be physically active. Many children are living in families where substance misuse is, is taking place. And many of the children that we work with are living with their grandparents because of complex issues in the family and with their parents. And grandparents are very often compensating for the situation the child is in, and that very often equals behaviours around food. Um, also, in terms of parenting, in many families, there's complete disagreement between the parents as to um, changes in lifestyle and changes in, in attitudes towards food and, and activity. And indeed, in many cases, family parents are living apart and children are getting contradictory messages. We've also learned in the course of this work that um, we have to take great care in focusing just on one aspect of change for, for a child and their family. Focusing on one issue without recognising um, and addressing other issues that are, that are involved for that family can make matters worse um, and can be a barrier to change rather than an enabler. We have to be very careful that we're not in fact doing harm while we approach these interventions. So for us, um, health behaviour change or health behaviour development should be about enabling and empowering and about building independence. And it, it's also about recognising and working with whatever strengths and capacities that young person or family have in the here and now. Um, it's about keeping it real, and that's been so important to us. There's absolutely no point in going with, in with an agenda that has, got, that has got no identification for that family. Building relationships has been absolutely fundamental and key to the work that we've done. And it's also been really important that we recognise our limitations. We don't know a lot about a lot of the issues that these families are facing, and we have to recognise that. And we also have to be careful not to create dependency. Um, this work is about enabling people to actually work out their own solutions. We can't make people fit our programmes, and we're working to ensure that what we do fits the reality of people's lives. So we're starting work at the moment on making a transition towards a more generic approach to the work in its totality. So rather than just having healthy weight workers, we're actually going to look at having more generic staff um, dealing with, with a whole range of issues. And we're also sitting that within the development of a life course approach to healthy weight in Dumfries and Galloway. There are times, of course, when it might be necessary to focus on a specific issue for a specific period of time. And this is an example where a potential need has been identified um, and where the issue is at the present time very much under the radar and not being recognised as a risk-taking behaviour among young people. We've been progressing some work around this in Dumfries and Galloway um, because um, the findings from this study initially came to our attention. Um, this is the finding that initiated our interest. An early investigation into national and international uh, data would suggest that this finding can actually be supported. However, there is a dearth of research around this issue, particularly in Scotland, and it absolutely does require further research. However, the literature did highlight and does highlight that problem gambling behaviours are closely associated with other risk-taking behaviours, such as substance misuse and crime, and closely um, linked to poor mental health, relationship um, breakdown and low educational achievement. Cultural acceptance of gambling behaviours, um, coupled with lack of awareness that adolescents can in fact develop problems with gambling, um, has minimised the attention that's been given to this area of work. In Dumfries and Galloway, um, we've hosted a multi-agency event to, to air what we know and to test um, how people um, feel about the issue and also their experience um, and what they have found with working with young people. And what we discovered was that within services, people are not talking about gambling with young people. And young people aren't talking to those that they work with about, about how this behaviour is impacting on their lives. Um, 
So we're taking a focus that um, looks at perhaps integrating and, and screening, I'm calling it screening, but actually just integrating conversations about gambling into other work that's going on with young people, actually placing it within what's, what's already been doing. We need to work with young people to find out what their experience is of this behaviour and also to look at building their own <coughs> skills and their own knowledge so that they might become more resilient to actually becoming involved with um, gambling and the risk of it becoming habitual. Now, locally and nationally, there has been a growing focus on using measures of well-being and, um, you know, to evaluate the, effect of the efficacy of the work that we do and also to monitor um, the well-being changes within, within the young people in our communities. And in our unit, we're looking to see if we can improve our working knowledge of well-being among young people, particularly in the light of the UNICEF report, which was mentioned earlier on. Um, we want to look at it in terms of the diversity of our own communities, because the experience right across the region of well-being is undoubtedly very different, according to where people live. And we also think that it's really important for informing our evolving asset-based approach to health improvement work. We're aware that a huge amount of data has been collected locally, but we're also aware that there's a whole variety of tools and methods being used, and that very little of it is being shared in ways that help us actually build an overarching picture of what's, what's happening. So we're building partnerships, particularly with colleagues in psychology, education and children's services at the moment, to see if we can actually narrow down um, our focus onto a number of tools that might actually have the potential to give us the information that we're looking at. And we're also looking at what, whether what is being collected is necessary and whether we can generate greater consistency. So essentially, we're wanting to look at what's been collected, when it's been collected, how it's been collected, and what on earth it's been collected for. Because a lot of this information just seems to be collected and then it gets hidden forevermore. And that's not fair for children and young people. Alongside that, we also have people who are involved in very specific works who are very clear that there are tools around identifying um, emotional distress and behaviour and conduct disorders that may actually require more specific tools um, to sit alongside the more generic ones. We're also very aware through the investigations that we've done that a lot of the tools and assessment uh, measures that are being used very much focus on deficit type questions and um, very little about the assets and the strengths that individuals and communities have. So needs assessment tends to be a, a fairly negative process. And um, essentially what, we're, what we want to do is to work in partnership to channel our efforts to improve um, the health and well-being of children and young people and to support them as they move into adult life. Now finally, um, sort of underpinning a lot of this or cutting across a lot of what I've already described is a piece of work that we're doing around developing health and well-being skills. Now we accept that this isn't new, but we also accept that there are opportunities um, with us at the moment that, will, that, that lend themselves to taking this approach. The Curriculum for Excellence, for example, is a case in point. It was already mentioned this morning that this is a, um, a, a holistic approach to um, delivering the curriculum and particularly the health and wellbeing outcomes within the curriculum. So, in other words, what we're saying is that no aspect of health and wellbeing stands alone and that all of the health and wellbeing areas within the curriculum and across the areas of work that we're all involved in in terms of risk-taking behaviours are underpinned by core health behaviour skills. And it's important that we understand a common understanding of these um, in order to support young people to, towards making positive life choices. This work is in progress, but these are the skills that we've um, identified so far and um, we're talking to partners about. We believe that this can provide a much more flexible approach to integrated approaches to risk-taking behaviours and other um, health and wellbeing improvements. So what we're doing around this um, I'm working with schools and clusters. We're working very closely um, with the team um, taking forward GERFEC outcomes around transitions for young people in our region. 
Um, I've also been doing some consultation work with young people because it was really important that we actually checked out that where we were going with this uh, matched in any way what young people might think about the skills they need. Uh, we're involved in a pilot with the Alcohol and Drugs Partnership, which uh, could be very exciting in that we're looking to, to, to locate a member of staff within a pilot cluster to actually build the capacity of school staff to take much more integrated approaches to issues around alcohol and drugs and to actually do some support and challenging work with groups of young people who are at risk. Also working with our employability partnership and um, as part of that, there's an initiative around joint work placements and we think there's huge potential for skills development within that. This work doesn't come out without its, its tensions. I suppose yesterday provided me with a very good example. Um, I'd just come back fresh from quite a terrifying workshop with a group of young people in one of our high schools where they were being very brutally honest and saying it as it is, um, which was really, really refreshing actually. Lots of honesty in the room, although it was very scary. And I came back full of this. And a very important person from our local authority who's got responsibilities around uh, taking some of this work phoned me to see where I was at. As obviously we've caused some twitchiness um, with some of the, the discussions that we've had. And I was full of it, explaining all this and we're talking to young people. It was, that's very interesting. However, what's your program going to look at like and what's your delivery mechanism going to be? And it was kind of like, oh, right, well, that's where we're at. And that's the reality that we're working mm -hmm. within. So for us, it's just to remember that, the, that this is actually a work in progress. Okay, I'm going to finish here. So in conclusion, these were some examples of work that we are moving forward with in some um, respects cautiously because we have to take people with us. We can't just jump in there and expect that everyone's going to fully understand what we're talking about. Um, to re-emphasize that uh, our key principle is about assets and strength-based approach in all of the work we're doing. And that for us and our partners, this is very much a learning journey, but very good progress is being made. I'm happy to report, and hopefully we'll get the opportunity to update you at some point. And just to say that Michelle and I are happy to discuss this with anyone who wants more information about any part of this, and these are our contact details. Thank you very much. Thank you.